How lovely to hear Easter songs still. I, in my travels, I sometimes find that Easter fades a little quickly. Uh, so it's lovely to hear some Easter canticles, even as we move now and begin to turn our eyes toward the closing weeks of Easter and the, the glorious feast of Pentecost itself. I want first to say thank you to Archbishop Melissa for the invitation to be here uh, at your synod. It's a great joy to, to behold this gathering. I've been here on other occasions at her invitation, and I'm always most grateful. You had a fabulous day yesterday, I hear. I uh, made some pretty significant decisions with respect to uh, uh, our church's commitment to uh, healing and reconciliation and self-determination for indigenous people, and the Diocese of New Westminster is clearly leading by a huge example. So congratulations for the work you did in the Synod yesterday. Uh, it's exciting when those kind of moments happen in the Synod when actually it feels like the main agenda is canons and constitution. <laughs> and then all of a sudden God comes crashing through the place. The spirit blows through and amazing things happen. It is a joy always to bring you greetings from all of your brothers and sisters of the Anglican Church of Canada. I come to this synod with this beautiful theme, Love One Another, Christ's Body, the Church. With gratitude for the witness of this diocese to the gospel over many years. Your witness has been imaginative, it's been creative, it's been bold, and it's been beautiful. And I am deeply grateful for the church and the Diocese of Westminster. I also come to this synod knowing that in just seven weeks, I will be chairing the synod in Vancouver. That will be the general synod. And let me say that I'm very grateful for all the work being done locally to receive delegates from across the country and to make them feel at home here in Vancouver and particularly in your parishes on the Sunday in the midst of the Synod. Between your Synod and the General Synod, I have, as you can imagine, several more diocesan visits. And between them, I have one pile of work to do. One pile of work to do in my own office at church hosts, ensuring that I leave that office in good shape, good order, neat and tidy for our next prime, the 14th in succession. The work to which I refer is archive. Files, papers, reports, reports to host of bishops in the Council of General Synod, addresses for diocesan and general synods and sacred circles. Attention needs to be paid in the midst of that work of archiving to what is absolutely essential for retention in the archives and for retention in the private office. What's absolutely essential? What's a must? A must keep. And then what about all that stuff that's not essential for retention, but it's interesting? And what about all the stuff that might just be helpful for the new primate as they begin their ministry on behalf of our church? And in this work, for which I've already given some considerable time with our archivist Laurel Parsons, I have a renewed appreciation for the ministry of archivists and registrars and chancellors and canon lawyers and lay and clerical secretaries of synods, deanery and parish councils. I have a new appreciation for church historians and novelists and the great care which, which they ensure that future generations of the church know the story of their forebears in the faith. 
So I always kind of think that the day the church remembers the venerable deed is their day. It's their day. You know, a lot of their work is behind the scenes and doesn't always get that kind of upfront celebratory credit that it so deserves. But this is their day. One in which, as we remember Bede, we honor their labors and give thanks for the competence and commitment and good cheer with which they go about their work for the church. For people like those whom I've mentioned, words are important. Punctuation is important. Nuance is important. Now Bede, the Venerable Bede, was just seven years old when his parents gave him to a monastery. They gave him to a monastery as a thank offering to the Lord. The monastery was uh, Wearmonth, and when he was 19 years old, he was ordained a deacon, and then 21 years later, ordained a priest. At heart, Bede was an historian, and the legacy of his labors, as we all know, is his work, The Ecclesiastical History of the English People, spanning the time from the Roman mission into the 8th century. Bede spent his entire life in that monastery, and near the end of his days, he is known to have said to his fellow monks, it has been my delight to learn and to teach and to write. He died in 735 on the eve of the ascension of the Lord. So how fit that we remember him as we look to the Feast of the Ascension next week. How lovely that on the day of his remembrance, the calendar of the church should have prayers in which we hear images of the school of divine praise, the table of divine truth. How fitting that the gospel reading should be parables about treasure hidden in a field and pearls of great price. How fitting that we should remember the scribes of the kingdom as being like the master or the mistress of a household, bringing out of their treasure that which is new and that which is old. How fitting that we should be mindful of those who help us to comprehend God as not only coming to us in ages past and in times present, but also fresh from the future. Those who invite us to not only cherish the might and mercy of the Lord's work in former generations, but to perceive the new thing the Lord is doing in our very midst, and to anticipate the wonders of what the Lord shall do in future generations. Signs of which are already evident, if only we have ears to hear, eyes to see, minds to perceive, and hearts to embrace. When I think of Bede, I think of Psalm 78, those few beautiful verses, I will open my mouth in a parable, I will declare the mysteries of ancient time, that which we have heard and known, and what our forebears have told us we will not hide from our children. We will recount to generations to come the praiseworthy deeds and the power of the Lord, the wonderful works he has done that the generations to come might know and the children yet unborn, that they in turn might tell it to their children. Don't you just love that sense of time, continuity, one moment 
in the midst of time which from the perspective of God is eternal. And then we hear those lovely words from Malachi in our Old Testament reading. The Lord took note and listened, and a book of remembrance was written before him, a book naming all those who revered the Lord and thought on his holy name. That was deep work. Through our own witness to the faith that we proclaim in the liturgy and the gospel we live day to day, May we be found worthy to be numbered among all those who revere the Lord, who think on his holy name, and who act on his holy will, that it indeed might be done on earth as in heaven. All those who in their ways, widely known and celebrated, and in ways unknown, yet treasured in the heart of God. Blessed be Venerable Bede in all his labors. Blessed be all those who follow in his help footsteps, helping us to remember our story. Blessed be God this day and evermore. Amen.